Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Tofai. Welcome to Hernia Talk Live, our weekly Q&A held every Tuesday on Hernia Talk Tuesdays. My name is Dr. Sharin Tofai. Welcome. Thanks for everyone joining me live on Zoom as well as Facebook Live at Dr. Tofai. Also, don't forget, I am on Twitter and Instagram at Hernia Doc. And every end of this session, you're going to have this episode and all the previous episodes uploaded to my YouTube channel. So please do subscribe to keep um, up to date with all that we talk about. Uh, last week, we had a really, really great session. I saw a lot of discussion on social media about it and uh, people talking on Hernia Talk as well as some of the other forums, including Facebook and Instagram about um, our guests last week. So I'm really happy that I was able to, to provide such excellent kind of discussion. Um, today we're going to talk about incisional hernias. Uh, I tend to do a lot of hernias of the inguinal region. Um, it's kind of like my preferred part of the body. That's where my specialty is. Most surgeons that do hernia specialty do not like the groin. <laughs> they tend to focus on the abdominal wall um, and major abdominal wall reconstruction. I find the challenges of the groin and pelvis like really fascinating and I'm especially interested in women's hernias. So as you know, women's pelvis is much more complicated than even male pelvis. Male pelvis is already complicated with the prostate, the bladder, the ureter, um, and all the nerves in the area. So um, I do like the groin uh, if I had to choose, but of course I'm a hernia specialist. I repair all hernias, flank hernias, abdominal wall hernias, um, some very rare lumbar and pelvic hernias. And so I thought we would spend some time today talking about incisional hernias. And many of you have sent me questions. So I have those uploaded. I hope that you all join me and also kind of um, uh, send in questions that you would like to discuss. But, you know, let's get at it. So let's first start to talk about what an incisional hernia is. So most hernias out there people are born with it or they acquire it as part of like an injury. An incisional hernia is very specifically a hernia you get after you've had an, an incision there. Let's say you had your appendix removed and now you have a hernia where your appendix was removed. Let's say you had your prostate surgery and they removed the prostate through the belly button. That's one area where we see a higher rate of belly button hernias, which are actually not primary belly button hernias, but are what we call incisional hernias, and so on. So incisional hernias are unique in that they are, by definition, a failure of the original closure of the, the opening. So that your surgeon had to make an opening in the muscle and the fascia to remove the appendix, the gallbladder, the uterus, the prostate, the spleen, the colon, whatever the situation is or they had to make an incision to address what's inside. Let's say you had a trauma uh, or hit by a car and you're bleeding inside, or you got a gunshot wound, or there's some cancer um, that need to be addressed. So they, or you have a bowel obstruction. So they had to make an incision to get to it. And that incision can be five millimeters or the incision can be five inches. Uh, it's irrelevant how big the hernia is. Once you get a hernia from it, it's by definition an incisional hernia. Why is that important? Well, the treatment algorithm is very different between a regular hernia of any type and what we call an incisional hernia. Once again, to get to be an incisional hernia, you should have failed closure of a prior abdominal wall hernia. So that already puts you at some sort of kind of category where just redoing what you did originally usually doesn't work. So there was a time when the surgeon made a cut, you sewed you up, it broke open, they took it back and they sewed you up again. That could be months to, to years later. You know what? Repeating the same thing over and over again and getting the same result is what? Definition of insanity. I think that's according to Albert Einstein, but I think he was quoting someone else. So therefore, the treatment of an incisional hernia is not to just close it up again, usually, usually. And the most famous paper was published by Dr. Johan Yeekel, 
which we hope to bring as a guest. He is from the Netherlands. And Professor Yeekel uh, wrote a great paper, um, actually not so great paper in retrospect, but the first paper to show that if you take an incisional hernia and you close it up like you did last time, the chance of failing is close to 60%. So 50 to 60% of patients will have a failure of that. And now you're, you're stuck with a larger hernia, longer, um, longer convalescence uh, for this problem, have to go you know, stop working again for whatever reason um, to, to have yet another surgery. So he then introduced, okay, now let's put a mesh in place and let's see how the mesh improves. And the result was pretty dramatic. So the, the recurrence rate in his trial stopped, dropped from about 50 to 60% down to about 20 to 30%. Now that's also not perfect, um, but since this is an older paper, since then we've had a lot of advancements in hernia surgery and we've improved the type of hernia surgery that is done to reduce that number as low as 10 to 15%, still not excellent, but you're dealing with damaged goods to be begin with. So 10 to 15% or 20% recurrence is considered acceptable for an incisional hernia because you're already dealing with a hernia that occurred because there has been damage or trauma to it. So that's kind of what we're gonna be talking about. Now, some of you will say, well, mesh is horrible. We should not be using mesh. You know, it's possible to actually perform an incisional hernia repair without mesh. Um, you can consider it for really, really small hernias, like fraction of an inch where, you know, you can maybe consider getting away with not putting mesh in. doesn't always work, but it's worth trying some, in some people. Alternatively, you could consider a major reconstruction of the abdominal wall without mesh. It tends to burn a lot of bridges. If that fails, which is a higher rate of failure than using mesh, then you're kind of stuck with even a bigger hernia and now with even thinner muscles and thinner uh, tissues. But in Dr. Ramirez's study where he's a plastic surgeon and he discussed anterior component separation where you basically take your muscles and separate them apart and then bring everything together. And in doing so, close the gap. Um, I believe he had about a one third recurrence rate. So uh, one third is not good, but two, that means two thirds of the people did fine, but it also implies a lot of complications from that. So I hope this sparks some, some questions from you all. Um, we'll go through many questions. I have about 15 questions to go through today, uh, plus any that you submit live. In fact, here's one live already. Uh, I have a hard ball of mesh recently removed, incisional hernia that went through my appendix. Okay, so it sounds like you had appendix surgery and you had a hernia from that. Lots of bowel loops and adhesions. Uh, one we post up and I feel very sore. That's very expected. Any recommendation for pain management? Okay, that's great. So we've discussed pain management after an incisional hernia. We had, I think I'm gonna say a year and a half ago. And we talked about binders, ice packs, anti-inflammatory medications, not doing too much narcotic because that's gonna make you constipated. Um, making sure you lose weight, you're not straining, you don't have a cough, make sure you're not smoking so that improves your outcome, specifically smoking nicotine uh, or using any sort of nicotine. So um, the soreness has to do with swelling and bruising in the area of your operation. And so that's an inflammatory problem. And so anti-inflammatories work. So ibuprofen, naproxen, that includes Motrin, Aleve, Advil, um, you can also do topical anti-inflammatories. I think ice is the best. And then you can, the second reason why people can get pain from such a big operation is the way the abdominal walls close is now a little too tight. Uh, and in being tight, that can cause pain and, and almost like a tearing sensation. So that sometimes a binder helps to take some tension off of the repair while you're healing. Um, the other option too is just to lose some more weight. If you have any weight to lose, 
uh, and that takes some pressure off of the, the repair and helps you out. So great question though, great, great question. All right, next question has to do with um, the concept of an incisional hernia at an inguinal hernia. So in general, we don't call recurrent inguinal hernias incisional hernias. We call them recurrent inguinal hernias. <laughs> it's a coding issue. It's a, it's, um, we don't usually call those incisionals because they're usually not the site of an incision. They're usually a site like where the surgeon went there for a purpose other than a hernia. Uh, it's usually the site of a hernia repair and that hernia repair recurred. So what is the concept of an incisional hernia occurring at the site of a tissue-based inguinal hernia repair? Great question. So the question basically means, let's say I have a tissue-based repair, Schnoldeis, McVeigh, Bastini, and now I have a recurrence. So how does that recurrence occur? Well, the way it occurs is the same way you have tears in your clothing. The area where the, you were sewn has torn apart. It could be a big tear like you see in jeans nowadays, or it could be a little tear like you may see in a jacket that you've worn for a really long time um, where it tears at the seams. So when you have a tissue-based repair, the way the surgeon operates is they take the muscles and they sew them together and there are sutures, usually um, synthetic permanent sutures, sometimes um, wire, uh, classically, that holds everything together. If that suture, sorry, if that closure tries to pull apart, fall apart, then you're going to be pulling at the seams, so to speak. And it's those seams, which is the interaction between the suture and the fascia or the muscle um, that tear. The suture almost never tears. Your tissue tears. And when your tissue tears, that leaves a hole. And when you have a hole, that's a hernia. So you now have a hole that busts open and you can have holes in it. Um, you have things to go through it or, or just have pain. Just the pain is from the tear itself and not necessarily anything going through the tear. So that's why tissue-based hernia recurrences are very difficult to diagnose because it's very subtle. You have to somehow put together the exam and the symptoms and the imaging as one conglomerate and figure out um, what's going on. So specifically for a groin hernia, um, sometimes imaging doesn't show a frank hernia where there's a hole um, or the holes are really small, um, but you can kind of tell based on the way that the tissues are, are together or are no longer together, pulled apart, um, what happens, uh, you know, whether, whether there's a hernia recurrence or not. So yeah, that's how it, how it does occur. And the best way to repair a tissue-based failure is a mesh-based repair, regardless of what we're talking about, whether it's inguinal or incisional. If you had a tissue-based repair, there's actually that's a good point. So an incisional hernia is failure of a tissue-based repair. That's a very like easy way to put it. So you had a surgery and they closed it without mesh because that's what we do for most abdominal walls that need regular surgery, not hernia surgery, let's say prostate surgery, hysterectomy, whatever, um, appendix surgery, that's closed, that's, a, that's called tissue-based repair. When that fails, regardless of whether it's a groin or it's abdominal wall, then the next set of operations should be done with a mesh in over like the, the vast majority of patients with very few exceptions. Okay, among the type of surgeries, number of previous surgeries, incision location, incision length. Okay, what factor mostly affects the probability of developing an incisional hernia? Okay, so I understand what you're saying. You're saying, what factor mostly affects the probability of developing an incisional hernia? Is it the type of the surgery, the number of prior surgeries, location of the, of the incision, or the length of the incision? It's actually very multifactorial. The two top reasons for incisional hernias have been shown to be number one, an emergency operation, so trauma and so on. And the reason for that is um, the patient tends to have blood 
and or stool uh, contaminating the area. And the patient tends to be quite sick um, for other reasons from the trauma. The second most common reason for an incisional hernia is a wound infection um, from usually a dirty wound. So let's say a colon surgery or trauma surgeries can be dirty uh, because of the type of trauma, whether the bowel was injured or they were dragged onto a, along a asphalt or something, or if they have a wound infection. So uh, wound infections tend to be in operations that are very long operations. They tend to be in operations where the incision is larger, so less likely in laparoscopic surgeries. They tend to be in operations where the patient is sicker, um, so diabetic, uh, any immune suppression, and the uh, incisional infections tend to be in patients that don't have healthy tissues. So prior surgery is one, um, uh, nicotine users, uh, and so on. So top two reasons for incisional hernia is either emergency surgery or an infection uh, of the wound um, due to contamination. Uh, and incision length and prior surgeries and type of surgery does affect, does affect those. Does, oh, let me make a second point on that. It's super important. I tell my residents all the time. It's super important that a wound infection is treated very early and aggressively. Because as I mentioned, it is the one of the top two reasons why people get incisional hernias is there was a prior infection. Um, in that area or contamination. So if you have a perfectly great operation and your wound starts looking red and then maybe a little painful and then there's a little bit of drainage, um, maybe like little yellowish drainage or gray drainage would be horrible, then do treat that early and don't wait it to be so bad that you have to go to the emergency room. And to my residents, I say, don't wait for it to be so bad that the patient's like, I'm now you know, uh, staining my clothing or my patient gown with fluid, because the longer you allow that, that infection to simmer, the more it's basically infection sitting on top of a perfectly good tissue-based repair. And when that happens, the enzymes from the bacteria are just eating away at the tissue. It's disgusting. It will weaken the tissue repair of the fascia. And then months to weeks to months to years later, they will have a hernia as a result of the delay in care of a wound type, you know, of a wound infection. All right, next question. Does minimally invasive approach have any impact on reducing the recurrence risk after incisional hernia? Well, um, yes and no. In general, the answer is no. We have not been able to show that a minimally invasive operation has any better recurrence rate than a, an open operation. In other words, the outcome should be similar in the, in the hands of similar surgeons. Now, it could be that some surgeons are better at one operation than the other, and their outcomes are better. All things being equal, a, a minimally invasive operation, so laparoscopic or robotic, should have the same outcome as an open surgery. What's different is, the only thing that's different is, the risk of wound complications, such as surgical site infections, skin infections, mesh infections, et cetera, is much lower with a laparoscopic or robotic, also known as a minimally invasive surgery. And therefore, um, that complication is lower. As well, the complication, as I mentioned, when you get a wound infection, your risk of hernia is higher. So um, that's a slight contributor uh, in an incisional hernia repair. And so choosing the operation with the least risk of surgical site infection will have a better outcome as well. Great question. Let's go to the next one. After incisional hernia repair, does the recurrence risk constantly grow with the years? Does it eventually plateau after a number of years? Okay, another great question. Um, all right, so 
we don't have very good long-term data. The Danish and the Swedes have the best long-term data because their whole country is one major medical database. And the Danes and the Swedes tend not to travel outside of their country much. So if you have had surgery in your country, the chances are 20 years later, you're still living in the same country. So based on that information, we do know that we do have 10 year and 20 year data. We don't really have data beyond 20 years. It kind of becomes not, not valid anymore. But based on that data, we do know that we have a constant but steady increase in incisional hernias. So if you operate on someone, the maximum number of incisional hernias occurs within, within the first five years, but that number still increases as you go further out. And the reason for that probably is multifactorial. One is people don't know they have an incisional hernia until it's larger. It just takes longer for the hernia to, to become large enough to, for you to notice it. So they've had it earlier, they just didn't know. The other possibility is that they are now older, sicker, uh, weaker, maybe more obese, or any number of other um, risk factors are now added to their problem, uh, making their risk of herniation higher. Also, we don't really know if in some of these people they've had another operation and that other operation is what contributed to an incisional hernia, not the original incisional hernia. The databases are not so transparent that we can um, tell that well, but it does not plateau. It slowly continues to increase. Um, and that's based on 20 year data. We don't really have data beyond that. Are incisional hernia repairs characterized by higher chronic pain rates compared to other kinds of hernias? Fortunately, no. So in terms of chronic pain, patients who have um, who undergo pelvic surgery, so usually groin angle surgeries, they are much more likely to have chronic pain than a patient that undergoes abdominal wall surgery. That's good news because, you know, it's good to have a hernia operation where you don't have to discuss too much about chronic pain. Um, that said, the chronic pain... Um, profile with abdominal wall hernias is often due to tearing recurrence um, and less of like a nerve issue. So nerves tend not to be that predominant on the abdominal wall, especially in the midline compared to, let's say, the pelvis and the groin. Um, and really people have pain if it's, there's a hernia that's recurred or torn or if the, the hernia is repaired too tightly. Now, that's not to say that, that people don't have complications from abdominal wall surgery. They do. Um, besides recurrence and wound infections, they can actually have really devastating complications that we don't typically see with inguinal and groin pelvic hernias. And that's um, uh, mesh erosions into the bowel and bowel-related complications such as uh, like fistulas. And a fistula means basically the bowel eroded. So what happens is you have a, a piece of bowel that's stuck or somehow touching some mesh. And if the mesh is not flat, that's a higher risk of a fistula. And then that bowel kind of erodes into the, into, sorry, that, yeah, the, the mesh erodes into the bowel, kind of like sandpaper over time and erodes into it until eventually there's a hole in the bowel and then that becomes a devastating complication. Fortunately, it's not common, um, but of course, many of you that are on this on this webinar already know that that happens. So um, it's a problem. Uh, it tends to occur not with flat meshes, but with meshes that are placed and for some reason are folded. Um, or at the edges of meshes, there used to be these meshes that you couldn't cut and the surgeons for some reason like didn't know that or didn't think about it I don't know what the process is and they would cut meshes and they would put it in and literally I had a situation where I was asked to help with a patient um, who had already had surgery and the patient already had some surgery and was in the hospital and there's poop coming out of the wound 
and they knew that I was there. So they asked me to help. So I go in there and see the patient. I'm like, ah, oh, shit. Literally, the there was stool coming out of the wound. Um, excuse me. And um, I knew there was mesh. I'm like, guys, you got to take this patient back. Okay, can you help us? Yes. So I take it back with the surgeon. Uh, and I look at the mesh and I'm like, did you cut this mesh? He's like, yeah. Like not thinking twice about it. I said, you can't cut this mesh. Oh, well, it needs to be smaller. Yeah, so you have to use a smaller mesh that's pre-made. These meshes you cannot cut because the way it's, the mesh is made is to protect exactly what's happening. The edges are softened and protected from being exposed to any, exposing any valve to any mesh. If you cut that, all the safety precautions that were a part of the mesh design are now taken away. You now have fresh mesh edge, like a knife cutting through the bowel. Of course you would have a, a bowel perforation within days of the, of the mesh being put in. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, the not all surgeons are aware of what meshes should be used for what purpose and, for, and not for others and uh, are not aware of the different intricacies of different mesh products. Um, it's quite, quite, um, quite interesting how little doctors know uh, about instruments and products and devices that they actually are using on a daily basis. And, you know, it's like, you know, when you drive your car, do you really know um, how to address one of the error signs on the, the car? Not everyone knows how to use everything in their car to its maximum benefit. Um, and the fact that they don't implies they're not using their car necessarily to its maximum benefit. But then when you're dealing with humans, I, I believe you need to know like your devices uh, much better. So sad story for that patient, but good teaching point um, for future generations. What percentage is the difference in chronic pain rate between pure tissue and mesh repair for incisional hernias? And is there any difference in chronic pain rate between permanent and absorbable mesh. Okay, well, this is a very different answer than if I were to give it to you for groin ingual hernias. So the chronic pain rate is actually much higher with pure tissue repairs than mesh repairs for incisional hernias. The reason is there tends to be a higher tension to the closure when done as a tissue repair. Whereas the mesh tends to take the pressure off like an internal girdle um, off of the suturing. And it's a suturing that hurts with uh, incisional hernias. So suturing hurts. If you add mesh, it tends to take the tension off of the suturing and doesn't hurt as much anymore. So interestingly, the chronic pain rate is, different, is better with mesh than without mesh and a pure tissue for abdominal wall incisional hernias. Is there a difference? Is there any difference in chronic pain rate between permanent and absorbable meshes? Um, yes, as far as we know, absorbable meshes have a lower chronic pain rate than a permanent mesh, mostly because it has a lower inflammatory potential. Now, the caveat is that absorbable mesh must be a low inflammatory mesh. There are absorbable meshes that are more inflammatory and more synthetic-y. Um, than your typical absorbable mesh. And there are uh, meshes that, are, that have a, are thicker, heavier, or have a higher inflammatory reaction than other meshes. So the higher the inflammatory reaction, the stiffer the mesh, the higher the chronic pain rate. The more kind of natural, I'm using that in quotes, the more natural the feel um, of the mesh, so the it's more like your own body's tissue, the lesser the chronic pain rate. And that is why all of these companies are super interested to help develop a product that as closely mimics this abdominal wall of the patient as like ten, um, uh, details uh, as possible. So it may stretch a little bit. It may be very pliable. It should have low inflammation. You shouldn't reject it. We don't really have a great product like that. Um, we have some products that, that 
are good in part one, some parts, but not good in other parts. So hopefully over time, technology will get us to a point where we can have fascia-like meshes to help support the patient's own natural fascia, but to today there's nothing good enough. Thanks for your question. For a patient with ventral hernia repair with abdominal wall reconstruction and component separation done robotically, what would you say is a typical recovery time? Okay, so there's a difference between robotic and open surgery. In my experience and the experience of most pay, uh, surgeons that do robotic and open surgeries, we notice that the robotic repair uh, recovery is much, much, much better than the open recovery. Now, of course, I think all my patients do well, but I do know with the robotic repair, there tends to be less tension, less manipulation of the, of the tissues and wider dissections without as much tissue trauma and therefore recovery is much easier. So for example, whereas a typical open incisional hernia repair would involve three to five days minimum of hospital stay only for pain control, the patient who undergoes a robotic operation of the same type goes home the same day, which is remarkable. Absolutely, absolutely remarkable. And um, once you're home, I would say the typical abdominal wall reconstruction with component separation needs a minimum two weeks to really feel like they're up to, you know, going back to work maybe or, or being more active at home. Whereas the robotic patient, you know, maybe within days, two weeks, they can go back to work. That's a typical scenario um, that I see. Thanks for that question. We should talk about robotic surgery, huh? Yeah, I think we got a question coming up on that. Do you see mesh implant illness cases more often among incisional hernia patients? And if so, what do you think are the causes? In fact, we don't. So I have had multiple patients with mesh implant illness from an abdominal incisional hernia. And the thought is that there's so much mesh used for these that that's one of the instigators. However, for some reason, there, in, at least in my study, we actually saw a large number of people undergoing pelvic surgery, inguinal surgery with mesh implant illness. And perhaps it's because there's more nerves and more sensitivities in the pelvis than there are uh, in the abdominal wall. Okay, so here's a patient who's undergone both open and robotic surgery. She reports that she's never felt good after any of her open abdominal wall reconstructions and the robotic surgery was so much easier to recover from. So thank you very much for, for that comment. Yeah, it's, it's pretty remarkable. Um, you can do an operation three or four times bigger in terms of complexity with the robot and have like a third of the recovery. It's so interesting. All righty, next question. For incisional hernias, are the advantages of using mesh partially offset by short and long-term mesh complications? Are the advantages? Yeah, so yes. So there are mesh-related complications. Short-term, they include um, some inflammation, maybe a pulling sensation, tingling, um, swelling, maybe fluid collection, uh, and then wound infection. And long-term, it would be um, tearing, maybe erosions. There aren't that many long-term risks. Mesh implant illness would be very uncommon. Um, whereas the benefit is significant. So if the majority of patients who undergo tissue repair have a recurrent, that's a horrible outcome. Uh, if you can reduce that number with mesh, then that's a really good that's a really good benefit, and that's why we use meshes. Now, again, you have to use the products appropriately. Um, I have so many patients that I hear about, um, or that I see who come to see me, and I read, and I'm like, "What? Huh? You did what? That's like that's like the wrong operation. Yeah, you had an incisional hernia repair, but it should have been done laparoscopically, not open." You should have put the mesh under the muscle, not on top of the muscle. You should have used this type of mesh, not that type of mesh. And I can poke so many holes into like why the patient had their, their recurrence. 
Um, let me give you a shout out to one of my colleagues, Dr. Nicolian in uh, uh, Oregon Health Sciences University. So he's done a great job in trying to address all of these like issues. So he has a national multi-institutional educational program every quarter. We all kind of log in. I'm always there with my residents. And it's an institutional educational program where we talk about hernias all the time. And what we do is with the residents and the fellows, they present an operation and we tear it apart. Why did you do it this way? Why couldn't you do it that way? Tell us about this part. What was this technique, et cetera. And it gets to people to talking because, you know, what I do is different than what happens in Alabama, which is different than what happens in New York, possibly. Or maybe what I say, the surgeon from Florida agrees with the surgeon from Washington State. It's like, no, 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 no. This is what, what's going on. This, is, this was my reasoning. So it's a very intellectually stimulating quarterly meeting. I love it. Um, we pick like, a, or he picks a, a topic let's say pelvic hernias, let's say incisional hernia, uh, robotic surgery, uh, inguinal recurrences, something like that. And then we submit multiple patient case scenarios and we use that as a teaching point. So I think it's very well done. It's been booming and growing uh, throughout the nation. Okay, next question. You mentioned it's the, that it's the width and not the length of an incisional hernia that determines the necessity of using mesh, true. Would not then repairing an incisional hernia as soon as it is found help in keeping the hernia small and thus allow for a pure tissue repair? Interesting concept. So here's how I'm gonna answer it. If you have a 10 inch incision and you have a quarter inch hernia, on the top edge of it. And it's usually like at the top edge where we see the hernias. And you fix that quarter inch. That's maybe all you need, great. You can maybe even get away with just putting a couple of stitches in it and not having it fall apart. However, that entire 10 inches is at risk for herniation at some point. So the logic doesn't hold. In other words, if you have a 10 inch incision and a quarter inch on the top has a hole in it at year one, and you go in there and you close the, the hole in the upper part, maybe at that level, you have prevented the hernia from progressing, but the entire hernia is still at risk for herniation down the line. Remember, one of the questions was, when, when do you stop having incisional hernias? Does it kind of continue annually, percentage-wise? Or does it plateau? And it does not plateau, it kind of continues. It's at a slower rate, but it still continues. And so it is not correct that by operating earlier, you can prevent your use of mesh. Now, that also implies that when you do go in there to repair an incisional hernia, we usually do not just repair the area that's herniated. We repair the entire length of that hernia because again, the, at the lifetime of that incision, you're at risk for herniation if you've already shown one area. It's like in your house, you know, like you're not going to just, I don't know, fertilize like one pot. Uh, like let's say if you have a a field of flowers, you're not just going to fertilize one flower, you're going to fertilize all the flowers uh, because they all share kind of the same soil and it doesn't make sense to just you know, improve the outcome from one rose and then not prevent like the de deterioration of another rose. That was a bad analogy, <laughs> but I don't know, I think that was a bad analogy. But if you know, understand gardening, maybe you'll get it. Okay, here's a question live. Let's go to that real quickly. So have you heard of complications from intubations such as dry cough? I had a scrotal hernia repair in August and the repair seems to be a good job, but I had a dry cough and an irritated throat a day or so after and it comes and goes, but it is weird. My surgeon said, make an appointment with the anesthesiologist. Um, actually, should, the anesthesiologist will not see you. They don't have offices usually. Uh, make an appointment with the head and neck surgeon. So a um, couple things. If you have a tube down your throat called intubation, 
for general anesthesia, which I don't usually do for ingual hernias, but um, for this very reason, because you can have a cough, let's say, and throat irritation afterwards. But um, if you do get how that the first day or two, you're going to have a sore throat and maybe even like irritation and inflammation, and then you, you cough. So um, obviously I'm anti-cough, so I don't want people coughing after my hernia repairs. I always minimize how much, um, I always minimize how much general anesthesia I use, but let's say you need a general, need a general anesthesia. What you do is just have cough drops for the first two days. Now, if you have a dry cough or irritation or a hoarse voice, um, constantly clearing your throat days to weeks after an intubation or longer, then there's something wrong. It may just be that you have acid reflux. And what happened is you had an irritation of the vocal cords from the intubation because it goes through your vocal cords. And then you also are doing acid reflux. So that inflammation never healed because you're constantly bathing it with acid. And so you need anti-acids. That's a very simple reason. It's also possible that you had an injury of the back of your throat or an injury to your uvula, that little baby tongue that hangs, or an injury to your vocal cord that can cause a polyp or any of the other uh, problems which is causing you to have a constant dry cough or itchy throat or, and so on. The best person to see that is a head and neck surgeon or ENT doctor. Um, they'll basically take a look, say, tell you, say, ah, oh, look at your mouth, look at your uvula, and then they'll stick a camera down to look at your vocal cord and see what's going on. If it's red, um, then that means you're having acid reflux, constantly burning that tissue and not healing the original inflammation from the uh, endotracheal tube. Um, if there's a polyp, they can see the polyp. So there are specialists within ENT that are auto, that are laryngologists. You know, they're technically they're otolaryngologists. They do ear, nose, throat. But there's those that only do throat um, that are called laryngologists or voice specialists. Um, if your town has a laryngologist, that would be the the best person to see because they see injuries from endotracheal tubes all the time. Do not go see your anesthesiologist. That's a waste of time because they'll be like, I don't have an office unless you're having surgery. You're not my patient. Okay, going back to the incisional hernia question. Therefore, should you not avoid watchful waiting for an incisional hernia if you want to maximize your chances of getting pure tissue repair. Um, again, no, not relevant. That will not, that will not necessarily get you there. Necessarily, it's, it's an option, but not necessarily. Okay, going back to the gentleman with the uh, the throat issue, I've had more pronounced acid reflux since then. Okay, so you must be on a very strong anti-reflux medication because you're constantly burning that that vocal cord. Um, and until that heals, you're constant, you're going to still be um, coughing. I assume that's a problem, but again, a laryngologist should be able to help you. All right. Can dense adhesions help prevent an incisional hernia or its recurrence? No, it does not. Unfortunately, two separate problems. The adhesions, the, the thought process seems to be can the adhesions kind of suck everything in and prevent the fascia from opening up because it's included in that. And they're not. Uh, the adhesions don't have strength to hold your abdominal wall together. Can adhesions be caused by an incisional hernia? Also, no. So, um, well, in some ways, you can have adhesions within the hernia. So what we call hernia sac adhesions, and people can have bowel obstructions within the hernia because of adhesions within the hernia of the hernia sac. Um, but that's kind of like slicing the bologna too thin. Like you need to, maybe I shouldn't say bologna, salami. You should slice the salami too thin because uh, either way, it's still considered a, a hernia related um, adhesion and bowel obstruction. 
What can cause back pain months after midline incisional hernia repair? Well, it depends on the reason for the incisional hernia repair. So one reason for back pain after hernia repair is your hernia recurred, and that's um, making your core unstable. The other possibility is that you already have a weak core because you've had an incisional hernia and now you have an abdominal wall hernia repaired and through this whole process, you've kind of lost your core strength and stability and that can cause back pain. In both situations, the more you strengthen your abdominal core, um, the better the back pain may be. And you can also work on your back core muscles too. And both of those should be totally safe to do even though you have a hernia. Given that minimally invasive surgery is becoming more common, how often do you encounter complex incisional hernias that require advanced techniques such as Robotar? Great question, because we, I am a minimalist. So if I can do an operation with less incisions, uh, better recovery, uh, less kind of something like more dainty, I will do it. So for example, uh, there are people that would use, do robotic surgery, and put like four, maybe five incisions. I prefer to use three. Um, or some people use robotic technology for every single type of hernia repair. And I don't do that. However, I do say, I must say that for really large complicated hernias, um, the robotic technology has really improved outcomes for my patients. So I do rely on it. Um, I used to never do these big ones laparoscopically because it's just too complicated. But with the open cert, with the um, robotic technology, I'm offering a lot of um, minimally invasive options to patients that before I would have done open because it wasn't going to be a good laparoscopic option. So yes, um, I'm happy to say there's more minimally invasive surgery being offered. Um, they tend to be more robotic than laparoscopic nationally because it's just easier. Uh, and if there's a higher pen penetration of robots um, in the US, it's probably not so true outside the US, including Europe, Europe because uh, it's just so expensive to have robotic technology outside of the US. Um, but you know, unfortunately in, in the US, medical care can be as expensive as we want it to be. Are trocar hernias still classified as incisional hernias? Yes. Can you repair them without using mesh? Um, yes, you can. Uh, you should not. That should not be your first option. But if there's a trocar side hernia and it's really small, like five millimeters, you may want to consider a bona fide tissue repair in one or two layers with permanent suture to help. Um, however, the correct answer, if you're being like given the oral board examination and so on is, you know, you, need to, you should be using mesh for any incisional hernia, including small ones from a truck car site. Um, great next question. What is the best test to check if mesh from a large incisional hernia is still intact? So if you mean intact, like the mesh is flat, not torn, not wrinkled. Um, for the abdominal wall, a CAT scan with, IV contrast should be adequate, oral and IV contrast. Um, in some situations, if you really want to be very specific about the mesh, you can get an MRI. Those are much more difficult to interpret for the abdomen because of the shape of the abdomen. Um, the MRI is an option. You'd have to get a soft tissue MRI. Uh, that said, uh, imaging, yeah. <clears throat> If you can find a really good ultrasonographer, um, they may be able to give you an idea of how the mesh is, but it's so hard to do that in the United States. Outside the United States, we have much better um, uh, access to uh, good ultrasonographers. And let's see, I feel like those are all the questions that were sent out to me. This has been great. I really like, uh, Talking about this, I did want to make a comment about robotic surgery. So um, there's a question about robotic TAR, T-A-R. TAR stands for transversus abdominis release. It's basically a posterior component separation. You may have heard of an anterior component separation. These are all different tools in the box. 
And I must say that um, I think it's a great operation. It's uh, an operation that has done an excellent job in providing relief to patients that had large hernias. I do feel it's maybe sometimes overused and it doesn't offer the best cosmetic outcome because what you're doing is just closing a hole, but you're not tightening the abdominal wall. So from a purely cosmetic standpoint, if you have a big hernia, it'll make you look not protuberant, but your belly will not be flat. And um, therefore, I do not offer robotic hernia repairs to everyone. Uh, I do offer it to the really small and the really large hernias, but the medium-sized hernias where you can really get a good flat repair for some people and get them to look even better than they did um, before I do those often open because I think cosmetically it's it's nicer. A lot of surgeons don't care about the cosmetics, like your hernia is fixed, go home. And the patient's like, but I still look like round. And the reason for that is there's no hole, but your muscles are still like not pulled together. And I feel that in the right patient, they should have that outcome. Next question. I've had two failed Pryotex mesh repairs, which wrapped around my bowels. Oh boy. I've lost 24 kilos now and I'm being offered a myocutaneous flap, okay? It's a very large hernia. Last operation was four years ago and it was a laparotomy. I'm now waiting for a CT scan. Okay, let me give you my two cents on this. So. If you've had bowels wrapped around mesh, I don't know if you've had this complication, but one of the major complications is, is erosion into the mesh. Um, if you're lucky, the mesh never eroded, it just caused an obstruction. And the obstruction can be dealt with uh, in kind of an elective way by removing the meshes and then um, cutting bowel and putting it back together again. However, if you have a full-on fistula where you have stool leakage, then that's much more complicated. Obviously, all the mesh needs to be removed, but all the infected tissue needs to be removed. The bowel that's causing the fistula needs to be eventually closed at some point, and then you're left with this big hole to close, given that you've already done poorly with mesh and been infected and now have a big hernia. So myocutaneous flaps, um, depends on what kind of flap. If you're having a component separation, so not a free flap, free flap is a different situation. Component separation, then that's a good, good choice. Uh, usually for uh, hernias 10 centimeters or wider, we have to use a component separation of some sort. And if that's being offered to you, it sounds like the surgeon knows what they're doc talking about. If you're being offered a free flap, or a flap like a um, latissimus flap or a mm, like glute, gluteal flap or some type of flap where they take tissue distant from your abdominal wall and bring it over to cover the abdominal wall. That works to fix an opening, but it's a not a very good long-term problem because that muscle will stretch because it's not really healthy. It doesn't have nerves that go to it. And so the, the muscle just stretches and you become really deformed by it. Um, those are very extreme salvage situations, but uh, you know, the, uh, it is the problem that we, that some patients have very infrequently um, and it is what it is. Um, okay, it looks like there's a question again about the incisional hernias and inguinal hernias. I, re I discussed this at length early on, and I hope that you can listen to it later, either on Facebook Live or on YouTube, because we discussed what happens with inguinal hernias um, that tear apart or recur. Next question, talking about cosmetic outcome of robotic TAR, is that the same case with reconstruction and component separation, also closing diastasis? Um, it can be, depends on your surgeon and what they plan to do. So if you have an abdominal wall operation and the plan is to close all layers, not just, so usually what they do is they, they break you into two layers, top layer, bottom layer. 
And a lot of times they close the top layer, but they leave the bottom layer not closed. Um, it's not just hanging there, it's just not completely returned to back to normal. In those situations, the bellies tends to be not as perfectly flat. They tend to kind of look like a square, um, like a table um, as a, and not flat. And that's because the front is closed, but the deep ones not uh, are, the deep muscles are pulled away and you end up like the sides tend to pooch out more than you wish. I don't like that. And I don't really offer that unless the patient is really, really uh, complicated and cosmetic because like the last thing on their list, they just want their hernia repaired so they can go back to normal lifestyle. Um, if you're having the diastasis addressed uh, and the hernia is not so big that you can close the top and the bottom layers, then that's great. But if you're going to close the top and the bottom layers and you have a huge hernia, then um, it's, what I'm trying to say is not everyone can have both layers closed. The larger the hernia, the less likely it is that both layers can be closed. The goal of a hernia repair is to close a layer. And often that's the top layer and um, the bottom layer is kind of left to be. I don't like that. And I tend to push the limits and I tend to close that bottom layer more than most surgeons because I want to get like a flatter cosmetic look in addition. But I'm not willing to give that cosmetic look if it's gonna hurt the hernia pair and make it a tear again. So it's, it's a decision. If your hernia is wide and huge, then it is where it is. You should be able to get the hernia fixed, but understand you're not gonna have a flat belly um, necessarily. But if you kind of have a medium sized hernia, then you know you potentially they can close the back layer and give you a little bit better cosmetic outcome than a typical robotic tar. Um, a lot of patients they end up a lot of patients that end up having these large robotic tars are not thin patients, and so. To be fair, with the extra fat they have on the between their skin and their fascia layer, you can't really tell what their abdominal contour is, whereas the thin muscular patient can. So that's kind of where you want to um, kind of just you know to have that discussion with the surgeon as to what your plan of care is. Um, going back to this patient who had the mesh wrapped around her bowels. They removed some of the mesh four years ago. Some. They didn't got to remove all the mesh. Okay. Don't get me started. They removed some of the mesh four years ago. This new surgeon said I wouldn't have a flat stomach. I looked nine months pregnant on my appendix site. Oh, your appendix site. Okay. We didn't discuss this, but the, the best outcomes are from the midline or kind of middle, middle hernias. If you have hernias on the sides, that's very, very complicated because the muscles on the sides are very weak. And therefore what you want to do, um, which is like repair the muscles, it's very hard in that the, the tissues don't come together very well. It's thinner, there's all the nerves in the area, you can, uh, and so on. So big hernias in the flank area are much, much more difficult to repair. Now, it, you can potentially get a flatter look. Um, I don't know how big your hernia is or how complicated the operation is, how big um, and, and what your, like, uh, how much fat is in the area. But um, my recommendation is if you've already had so many complications, the goal is to get you to be pain free and hopefully hernia free. And the cosmetic part, unfortunately, it's going to have to be less of a priority because you don't want them to do extra work to make you look prettier at the belly at the risk of hurting the hernia repair. And then you're going to have another hernia repair, which needs more surgery, or you're going to tear, or you're going to have a bad outcome. So focus on getting a good hernia repair outcome. And then the flatness part um, can be dealt with later. That's kind of my two cents. So I don't know if you guys think the way I do. Um, I always think, you know, quality of life is great and 
cosmesis is very important. It's a huge part of what I do and how I how I operate, but um, it cannot hurt the quality of the operation and the repair that I provide. And that's it, my friends. Thank you for another great hernia talk. I'm going to be taking some time off. So please follow me on Twitter to um, get some more education. Uh, I'll be live tweeting at some different society meetings and give you some feedback that way. I will see you in three weeks. Um, actually, no, I'll see you next week. And then I'll be missing uh, two sessions, two weeks uh, after that. So I will see you next week join me, get your questions ready. And then um, I'll be live tweeting at some of these uh, surgical society meetings that I'll be attending the weeks to, to follow. So thank you very much for joining me.